Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. On this week's episode, Johnstown Castle Farm Manager Aidan Lawless joins us to review the performance and genetics of the cows in their winter milk herd and the recent focus on homegrown protein sources in their concentrate feed. And I first asked Aidan to outline the principles of the production system. The herd has been here in existence for a long time now, and it's developed over the last number of years. So um, we, we have a high EBI herd. The overall herd EBI at the moment is 190. So um, I suppose previously we would have been looking at very much developing a sort of a blueprint for in terms of grassland management for the, the autumn herds. And um, I suppose just determining whether that sort of EBI system fitted in with, within for, for winter milk and herds and calving in the autumn and how they perform on that. Um, more recently then for the last two or three years, we've been focusing uh, a good bit on just the, the winter diets and um, just looking at, can we, uh, the, the trial at the moment is looking at um, homegrown soya, uh, or not soya, but homegrown protein uh, to replace the uh, imported soya and just more in terms of looking at it from a point of view of CO2 emissions and just reducing the dependence on, on imported feeds. So at, uh, at the moment for the last couple of years, all our, our uh, protein within the, the, the concentrates would have been either homegrown or EU sourced um, non-GM uh, uh, rations and then just sort of comparing them how to perform with the, the conventional, what our conventional we would have been saying was the, the imported soya as the main protein source. A lot of talk around winter milk um, in, is, is leaning towards production, um, you know, and you mentioned the EBI and the, the fit between EBI and the system. So I suppose if we firstly look at production, um, how has production gone in the 2021-2022 lactation um, and how has that compared to previous years on the farm? Today is we're we're pretty much the same as as the last uh, for the last for the last two or three years we've sort of been increasing I suppose the the milk solids are, were probably increased maybe up to ten kilos a, a year over the last number of years I suppose so so our full lactation the 2020-2021 season we would have um, produced around six thirty six thirty five kilos milk solids for the the autumn calf and cows so the the hundred percent autumn herd off about seven and a half thousand kilos. Uh, of of milk so and then you're talking about delivering somewhere between around 610 kilos of, of solids per cow um and uh, there, that was across a, a couple of different stocking rates but the per, per cow performance was, was quite similar um so they're 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 high we've been even over the last number of years that the herd in terms of the ebi that's coming from the the herd average for the the milk kgs is about 135 i think at the moment um, and the bull team that we're using uh, is only given about 140, so we're probably trying to hold the milk around that. But um, our milk solids, we're nearly doubling the milk solids. So the, the, the cow herd are, are sort of giving us about 22 kilos milk solids, and the bull herd are up about 36, 37 desires that we're using the predicted uh, performance for the, the, the herd, the, the, the bulls coming in. That 10 kilograms of, of extra milk solids per year, you're growing the, the milk solids output. Would you say that's all down to genetics or are there other factors at play there? Probably a lot of it down to, to genetics, to be fair. Um, I, I think for the last number of years, we've had fairly good handle on terms of the, the grassland management and then our diets actually just the winter gone out, um, uh, our silage was poorer than the normal. And we did, we, our performance, we seemed to match the performance, but probably at a cost of an extra 100, 150 kilos of concentrate over the winter period. Um, we, we just got caught uh, last uh, spring there that uh, we didn't cut our main crop silage for the winter herd until I think it was about the 1st of June, which would be two weeks later than what we'd be really targeting our target date for, for winter, the winter herd is they've cut their first cut silage around the 15th of, of May. And even that, all that silage would have been grazed. It generally would be all grazed before that. So it'd be only grown for about six, seven weeks. And I think that's really key. Any, any winter milk guys are, are well, from, well aware of it, but sort of uh, get your base right first and your base is a, a good sort of grass forage. Um, and then it's a lot easier to, to match your diet after that to get to performance. So 
Um, our yeah, our performance uh, we've matched it this year. Um, but uh, off of probably feeding a little bit extra concentrate. But the in terms of the the grow on the milk solids, we probably didn't grow it. We probably might not grow it this year if we match our performance again this year. We're on about um. 510 kilos milk solids produced so far that's off about 220 day lactation so another 80 days at a kilo and a half probably is giving us about 100 another 120 kilos of milk solids they're they're still doing over 2.2 kilos solids like but so we should do comfortably for the next couple of months we should still do sort of a kilo and a half to 1.75 kilos of solids so we should we should get near to 630 640 kilos of milk solids anyway i'd say but that's coming off a a concentrate feeding level of probably 1.6 tons this year, which, yeah, we, our target would be maybe 1.4 of a of a normal winter. And that figure, the 630, 640 kilos of milk solids, it's it's a phenomenal number. You know, if if you look at it in its entirety. Now, I mean, you, you do mention the side note. There is, um, you know, a high level of feeding going in, given the the profile of the lactation and the months of the year you're milking those cows. Um, but what sort of lactation length are you achieving with those animals? We're getting very near to, yeah, so probably about 300 day lactation. Now we do, we do aim because we're a hundred percent autumn herd. Uh, now we have spring herd uh, calving here as well, but they are a hundred percent autumn herd at the moment that's on trial. So we do aim to be dry for at least three weeks in um, sort of the end of August, uh, early September. So like I say, to any groups coming in, if you're, spring cabin you take your holidays in the winter if you're autumn cabin you take your holidays in the summer and if you're split cabin you mightn't get holidays at all so um yeah so we, we we aim to be dry on that herd for at least three weeks but we can push our lactation we normally we try to give them sort of 50 60 day dry period but um with the compact cabin we're still getting about 300 day lactation um actual uh, lactation on it and like i said that's given us those that those cows are very similar. Like we have spring cows here on on other treatments, and we're using the same sires, the same type of sires, our same criteria, sort of high high milk solids, um, on reasonable volume of milk, um, and high fertility cows. So it's the same bulls we're using, and the spring herd are probably only given somewhere around the five forty kilos of, of solids, five forty, five fifty. So there's seventy or eighty kilos extra milk solids on that winter milk herd. But there, I suppose that a lot of that is coming through through that sort of extra feeding that, that that's going in, and we do tend to to get a flatter um, uh, milk peak sort of our lactation curve, a flatter lactation curve, I suppose, on the autumn herd. So we get that sort of kick from the the grass when we can get them out early enough in the spring. Then once we have grass there, so they're on a good diet indoors in the winter. We don't see any real boost from grass on, in the spring, but it's just keep them up and then keep good quality grass into them for all right up until that sort of June, July period when they're coming towards dry off there in July. So if we take a look at, at you know, fertility performance, you know, what are the KPIs that you would chase? Um, you know, they're non-negotiables for your winter milk system. We start off with our we, we, our breeding season. Um, we have two 10-week breeding seasons here. Like, the, the now there are independent herds, but because from a practicality point of view we, we aim to breed just for the 10 weeks in the in the autumn and the spring uh that's doesn't come overnight either and we would probably have sort of back the years when our fertility fertility performance might be as good we would probably were, were sort of breeding maybe for 12 weeks like but you you sort of shave it back a little bit uh each year so um and so we start breeding the 15th of december we're finishing up the about the 23rd 24th of february um Obviously, we're targeting sort of very similar to spring herds, right? And we're targeting over 90% submission rates sort of um, in the first three weeks. And we do uh, generally short cycle the heifers. So we'll breed them just for the first six, seven days and then um, um, a shot of prostate land and then to, to, to get them all served within the first 10 days. And then the repeats are, are coming in within the first uh, the first 30. Um, I, the, the 15th of December is probably governed a little bit by we try to avoid have uh, to try to have all the heifers served and, and before Christmas uh, Christmas week so um, especially here it's a sort of a week where uh, obviously we're still busy milking and, and breeding the main herd but just have the, the big volume of the, the heifers that were they're not coming in during that week if that wasn't the case we probably could afford to push out the, the, the start to start to breeding to another week maybe the 25th of September I know 
there's a number of farmers, a lot of farmers. We're probably unusual in the sense that we're 100% autumn cabin and we have a, a, a lot of our milk is contracted for the, the, the winter. The herds that are maybe have a lesser, lower uh, uh, winter milk contract, sorry, and some of them are calving later, maybe calving to the shed in, in mid-October for, for a short breeding period as well. And if it, that might definitely be work sort of viable for them as well, like that uh, they're, I suppose they're trying to avoid uh, given free milk really or, or non-contracted milk during the winter period, which is, is, is a, isn't a bad approach. Um, there's a cost to that if your fertility isn't good, obviously. Um, for the last number of years, we've been had very excellent fertility really, like we're, we would be targeting sort of temp, less than 10% empty and up until this year, we, for the last three to four years on the autumn herd, we've been, we've been achieving that this year. We're looking at 14, 15% empty. Um, we're not really sure, to be honest, why at, at this stage, just, uh, we, didn't, we didn't hit that 90% submission rate either, which is uh, interesting. And uh, maybe the fact that like our silage wasn't as good, maybe that could be a contributing factor as well, even though the performance, milk performance seemed to match, maybe just the activity seemed to be, or maybe it's just one of those years, like we wouldn't be overly concerned about it um, just as a, as a one-off. Um, cows, we know, it's well achievable and we have a, a a good number of heifers replacements coming in if we want to, but we do try to keep that um, uh, sort of, you know, we're, we're targeting sort of four and a half lactation per unit per cow. So we, we don't want to be bringing in too many heifers. We have surplus heifers actually to bring in if we do need to, but ideally we'll be targeting 20% sort of replacement rate and, and we should be able to stick to that still. At the outset, you talked about a focus for the last two to three years is is looking at those winter diets, but also looking at um, supplementation. I suppose that the first thing um, that that is probably a priority for every winter milk producer is that that base forage, um, that it's of a good quality. Um, you mentioned last year you were late getting to first cut. How did that fare out this year? Yeah, well, so well, so this year we uh, again we were, were late, but not as late. So uh, we probably just missed the window. The, I, I, there was a, a number of farmers around our area cut there, sort of in the the weekend of the the thirteenth, fourteenth uh, May, the twelfth and fourteenth May. Um, we got uh, we we're lucky enough the weather sort of we got a window, so we we did it there only a couple of days ago. We 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 harvest nineteen twentieth. Um, it's still in good conditions enough, and our target, like I said, was around the fifteenth May. So we probably lost three or four days. It needed to be cut at the time. It bulked an awful lot in the that sort of, I suppose, 10, 15 day period from say about the, the 5th of May to the, the 15th of May. It just, I couldn't get over, like it was slow enough all along. We've had a good spring. There's no point in saying we haven't, but the growth rates were probably slow enough for a lot of April there. Um, and then it just, uh, when we got that rain and sort of the heat, it just, the whole place exploded in same same as most farms um, in early May. So we look, we're happy enough. I'd say the quality should be a lot better this year. Like I said, it was all grays. It uh, was good leafy grass. Uh, the dry matter, ideally, we'd have had a little drier going in. We, it got a couple of showers before it dried off then when we picked it up. But um, So we're, we'd be happy enough that I, we're not... Um, our general, obviously, we're targeting silage greater than 75 DMD. Um, and a lot of time with our main crop silage, we, we, we fall a little short of it. That's sort of 73 to 75 DMD. And I expect it's probably something similar uh, this year. Last year, our first cut tested uh, only about 70. Uh, we ended up, we had second cut that was a lot better. It was about a 72 DMD and dry. So we fed that to a lot of the, the milk and herd, but we did have to feed some of the, the first cut uh, as well, to, just to mix it up to, to make sure we had enough. But, so yeah, just, uh, I don't need to, any winter milk guys that are on here will know well enough that sort of it's crucial to, to make good quality silage. Um, uh, and then, like we say, we can um, adjust to other um, forages after that. For for last year, last winter, we probably partly because of the poor quality silage, we 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 fed a sort of a fifty fifty mix of uh, uh, grass silage, maize silage. So sort of the um, it was sort of generally coming in sort of a third uh, concentrate, a third forage uh, forage maize, and a third of the grass silage was probably. Uh, what we were sort of coming up with um, intakes somewhere around 22 kilos of dry matter intake. Um, so we were getting good intakes. And like I said, 
we just had to feel a bit extra concentrate than we, we might have normally. And it's an interesting one, you know, that you, you, you know, the the level of testing that you're doing, Aidan, you can quantify, um, I suppose, the effect of early or late cutting. And, you know, that 75 DMD that you're targeting, you know, as you say, you really need that mid-May cut and anything after that, you're compromising your quality. Um, you know, even at that 70 DMD on the 1st of June that you achieved last year is really, really excellent and probably above um, above normal um, June cut. But also to put the crude figure of, um, you know, the additional concentrate that had to go into the diet of those animals um, during the winter time because you had compromised quality relative to what what you generally set out and you know 200 kilos there's there's obviously a financial cost to that um and 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 i actually think grass quality is something that you know spring uh production systems are becoming more conscious of because you know we've high calving rates we want a high closing cover to have a high opening cover uh, and sometimes then overwinter growth can be disappointing so there you know in early and late lactation there's often um you know a level of silage going in um and that needs to be of good quality particularly in the springtime Oh, de- yeah, definitely. Like, and, and like, there's no point in saying that like 70 DMD silage isn't good enough for for winter milking cows, really. Like, uh, I, and it's interesting just looking at we be <clears throat> we get regular sort of analysis back just on the silages, but just you know, I mean, even some of the the companies like the you know the uh, kgs of concentrate required to deliver your 28 uh, liters of milk. Now we're generally targeting about 30 kilos sort of uh, across the, the the winter, but like. You can see straight away, like if your if your if your silage tests sort of below that sort of you know 72, 70 DMD, you're you're talking about a lot more concentrate going into, and then it gets trickier in terms of, like for the last number of years, we've had virtually no terms of sort of um, acidosis or di- dietary ketosis or any sort of digestive upsets, right? And if you have a good base forage, you don't need to load the cow as much with concentrate, and she sort of. Um, better able to sort of, you know, to better able to perform and handle that. Um, so yeah, they, yeah, uh, good quality silage. And like I say, a lot of our spring milk producers now are at least, I know Joe would have been saying before, uh, you know, at least have, I think a bale and a half, sort of two bales of excellent quality silage for your, your as your buffer. But like, even on top of that, you're still going to be feeding silage to, it's just, important to have it there if you do need it it's a lot easier to loot the quality of the silage than improve it anyway so yeah and, and look as as things are progressing and concentrate prices are higher it um you know sometimes it, it is um a lot more um i suppose financially uh sustainable to have that that silage buffer the, the second point you made aiden was in relation to that homegrown protein um and that you know i have heard it on uh, other farmers doing the same thing um I, I suppose you're replacing imported soya with alternative feeds what are those protein sources it's really interesting to be honest uh, like so and uh, we're i suppose the idea of doing it on the winter milk herd is you're you're really pushing it to the max. So like I mean, if we're we fed a fifty percent maize in the diet, so our protein and that was going to be low anyway. So our our requirement say last winter with the, the grass silage in the maize, we had sort of we needed a, a concentrate uh, for the winter of sort of 23 percent uh, protein nut, which a lot of spring guys right and wouldn't need to. So if it was going if it's going to be tested, it would be tested on that. So um. Uh, Soya, um, so the soya is the conventional system, whereas the, the homegrown we were talking about beans was making up a, a, a huge portion of that. So there was about thirty six percent beans in the in the homegrown nut, and then about another thirty percent uh, rapeseed meal, which sort of probably generally come in the EU more so than than Ireland. The beans were uh, Irish sourced, um, and then a, a fiber sort of uh, some some beet pulp sort of as a, as your fiber source and there was barley uh, in it as well all all homegrown um products so the and cows um for the last uh, for two years prior to this year we, we ran a, a, a tighter component study this year mike Deneen from moore park was involved with that it was moved on so um we, we, for the pr- two years previous to that we were sort of we we weren't sure whether it was the the concentrate was given it because our diets were somewhat different. We were sort of looking at 
fully self-sustainable sort of just grass silage and and your homegrown nut versus a, a grass silage maize and sort of a higher input system so this year basically all we looked at was the only difference in the two herds of cows was that that homegrown nut um so it was fed through through a tmr there was a small base nut going into parlor we didn't have the option of a two feed system hopefully we will next year but so the parlor there was, there was about a, a a kilo a kilo and a half going in in the parlor of the same nut and then anything on top of that was all uh, fed through the TMR for the winter milking cows. And at the end of the year, we still came up a little short. We we were, I think about 15 kilos uh, milk solids less on the on the homegrown versus the, the conventional. So just on very raw data and conclusions, we'd say sort of at the moment that sort of, it's very hard to get a, a protein source that can match the soya uh, consistently. That's great. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Emma Louise. Thank you. That's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast. And my thanks to Aidan Lawless for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.